Anyway, we are really uh, privileged to have Professor Sokolov to give us uh, the first lecture, kickoff lecture for the frontiers in combustion. <coughs> Professor Sokolov is a professor at Princeton University, uh, my colleague at the, in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. Uh, without any doubt, he is uh, one of the world's preeminent scientists in the issue of energy and environment, the policies, uh, technological assessments, and definitely a leader in, 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 in identifying the problem areas and, uh, and uh, you know, what we should uh, go about solving them. Uh, he has been on many, many government panels, uh, uh, international panels, and U.S. government panels. So again, as a leader in, in, in this area. So we're just so privileged. He's a very busy person, too. So we're very privileged to have him to, uh, to spend this afternoon and, uh, and uh, do the kickoff meeting for the, for the Frontiers in Combustion. So Professor Sokolov. Okay, greetings everyone. Now, promise me that you'll tell me if you, for some reason, don't hear me clearly, particularly in the back rows. Is the, is the amplification sufficient right now? Excellent. I can get only so much higher. You see how to do that? Yeah. Okay, let's try that. Okay, is that better? Probably not much better. So I can I can talk louder, but they seem not to be well. Shannon was not able to do more. Maybe you can find an amplifier there. Okay, so let me let me start by saying that this is a very exciting opportunity for me. Uh, Professor Law is my colleague, and yes, partly I'm doing this as a colleague to colleague favor, but I have been on an engineering faculty for 40 years, and I am always concerned that the engineers not take a problem as given from somewhere else, but understand where it comes from. And I am able to practice what I preach today because my goal is to give you the context. My goal and my assignment was to give you the context for what you're doing in combustion. You will not see any details of combustion today. But why need you, why might you want to understand this uh, work in combustion? What kinds of problems will that enable you to solve? And in particular, you see it already on the title there, that in your professional years, the next 50 to 60 years, and I'm talking, my primary audience in, the, in my head is the graduate students. I know there are people a little further along in their careers, but I'm looking at graduate students we have 50 to 60 years of career ahead of them, and that's the majority of them. We are squeezed on this planet. It isn't big enough for us. This was never true before. There are only about a billion of us now living well, and of course we want to live still better, but there are seven billion people on the planet. We all want to do a lot of stuff in our lifetimes. And the challenge of figuring out how technology can help make that possible is an enormous and new challenge, a novel challenge. It was not on the minds of your professors when they were your age, for the most part. It has arrived in the last few decades, and its implications are, uh, are daunting. And you guys, are going to be, you guys and gals are going to be part of solving that problem. So my opening slide is a bit of a pep talk. I can carry this around. It says you can learn anything, and I mean that. One of the things that learning how to think quantitatively and understand models and measurements allows you to do is to wander into other people's fields and to ask questions and to figure out what's going on. It be a specialized vocabulary. You have to decode it, and then you realize there are a few key equations or concepts, and, you're, and you've got your arms around something new. That's what I've done my whole career, wander into other people's fields, uh, find out what's going on, find some interesting things to say. I want you to do that too. The problem, as I said a moment ago, is fitting on the earth. And the uh, overall idea here, and most of today's lecture, two lectures, is what I call planetary thinking. The scale of the system, the, the thermodynamic system, is the earth. 
it's its exterior, which is the, uh, the typical thermodynamic system boundary. Much of the time, not always, but it's a very interesting particular thermodynamic system to think about. So we have two lectures with a half hour break. That's a lot of material. It's more lecturing in one afternoon than I may ever have done. It may be more, le more listening for you than I have ever done, although I think I probably have put in some three hour listening sessions. But it's gonna be a challenge for you to stay with it and for me to stay with it, but I think we can do it. The overall idea is that in the first part one, we kind of set up the problem, what kinds of problems are there to solve, and in part two, we look at solutions. Specifically, the first part, the next hour and a half, is about climate science and ways of thinking about the future, particularly the future from the point of view of emissions and particularly carbon dioxide emissions as people do stuff on the planet, burn things on the planet. Um, I want to discuss climate science not as a set of finished, a finished subject, but a work in progress with much that is incomplete. I think if you only read the media about, uh, read and listen to the media about climate science, you might think it was all settled, but it isn't, and I think I can try to give you that with some, in some detail. We come to future emissions. Uh, of course, everything is up for grabs. Nothing is determined about the future, but we have some major ethical issues to think about, about inequality and the poor, and I want to bring that out in the course of the discussion because it points to some of the things that you may well want to work on yourself. The combustion climate change link is through two uh, different, very, both very important uh, physical connections, carbon dioxide, there are more, but the two principal ones, and aerosols. And as many of you know, they, op they act in opposite ways for the climate. The carbon dioxide tends to warm the Earth's surface, while aerosols tend to cool it by reflecting sunlight. And we'll be getting back to that. But you are looking at combustion, you're burning stuff. If it's a hydrocarbon of any kind or a, car a carbonaceous material of any kind, you're gonna have carbon dioxide as a product which you may want to do something about. Today, we generally vent it to the atmosphere, and that's that. One of the things you will be challenged with is why vent it to the atmosphere? You've already gotten the energy out. It doesn't have to go to the atmosphere. Where else might it go? That's another theme we'll be talking about. As for aerosols, the amount you generate depends on how you burn. And making less, less aerosol through combustion is going to be an objective with many reasons in public health, but also implications for climate change. So you'll be thinking about aerosols and carbon dioxide, and here's, I hope I'll be telling you why. Let's start, though. I, I, I warned you that I would look at the Earth as a thermodynamic system, first of, first of all. To first approximation, the Earth has one energy source, warming it up, and one cooling mechanism to stay in balance. Both involve black body radiation. The sun is a black body at about 5,600 degrees Kelvin. We intercept some of its outgoing radiative energy. We would get hotter and hotter, except that we have a cooling mechanism, uh, which is radiation to space, which is a lot colder than we are. And with a simple calculation, how many of you have done this calculation to estimate the temperature of the Earth in this room? I want to get a sense of how, how much. So about 15% of you, maybe, have seen this. It's fun to work it out. The, the, uh, the, uh, the um, Stefan Boltzmann constant is a particular value. You put in the incoming sunlight. You ask what temperature would be necessary to radiate energy away at the same speed as it's coming in from the sun. And you get a reasonable temperature in the 200s Kelvin, just by that. Uh, and then you have realized that you've got to do some adjustments. But it's worth trying that problem if you, if you, know, you know the subject well enough to get started. The solar input to the planet intercepted by the disk, which is the Earth, as seen from Sun, is 120 times 10 to the 15 watts. And there's a natural number to compare that with, which is human activity in the form of energy generation, which is primarily burning fossil fuels. It's also uh, fissioning some nuclei, and that's pretty much it. That is new energy that we add, so-called primary energy from the human system it's 10,000 times smaller. 
you see the numbers there, just a bit above 10 to the 4, uh, just a bit above 10 to the minus 4. Um, so we are not significantly warming the planet by burning stuff and adding an energy term to the sunlight term. In fact, our energy term is similar to the tidal energy, which is not counted in this picture, and to the geothermal energy coming from below, which is not counted in this picture. They're all much, much smaller than sunlight. So the planet is not getting warmed by our direct combustion. It is getting warmed, however, by something else. Uh, by the way, you see there that, I, that that number, the human activity, is about two kilowatts per person, that being a unit of energy per unit time, right? So we can do it that way. So let's look at those two black bodies. They are almost not overlapping in frequency. They differ by a factor of approximately 20 in temp absolute temperature, in their peak temperature, or their, bla their black body temperature. The uh, sunlight at about 5,600 and the Earth at about 280 is a 20 to 1 ratio, which becomes a 20 to 1 ratio in peak frequency. And, and the lines there are the black body curves and the, let me start using a, a pointer, uh, these red areas here and blue areas here are what gets through on one path. It's taking into account the gas which is in the atmosphere absorbing incoming or outgoing radiation. Um, and we can ask, and there's lots of room in the bottom of that picture, you might be suspicious, I'm about to pop something in there. Well, I am. Uh, the actual gases that are responsible for the various absorption lines and, and uh, bands that are affecting this, the, sun, the, the uh, energy balance of the Earth. Notably, uh, on, the, on this side here, this is the ultraviolet light from the sun that would sizzle us, give us skin cancer, and actually make life nearly impossible. Intercepted, fortunately, out to the very edge of it. This is all not arriving at the surface, but indeed peril to astronauts. Uh, that is uh, ultraviolet at below about three, uh, three tenths of a micron. And, they, um, and that is, sorry, that's not the right number, three mi two microns. And there. Um, and that is almost completely absorbed by oxygen and ozone, as you see over here. On the, in, on the outgoing radiation side, it's also not a clear path. In fact, quite a large fraction of, a larger fraction of the outgoing radiation doesn't make it through in one pass because of gases in the atmosphere that are absorbing infrared radiation, notably the carbon dioxide, which doesn't look like that big a part of it. Water vapor is doing a lot of the work, but it's there in such quantities that we generally don't, we, we, well, it does amplify the signal as well, but the carbon dioxide is the one we're directly affecting. And you can see other gases doing their job as well. Many of you know this subject. I don't want to take more than just an introduction to it, but it's very familiar territory given your backgrounds. The carbon dioxide band, let me just, we're going to look here it. oops, here it is at 15 microns, we're going to blow it up in the next picture, is saturated at the center. Its wings are what absorb or don't absorb, depending on exactly how much CO2 is involved. The, the line gets broader as CO2 goes in, and that's the extra warming that comes from, carbon, from burning stuff. So the combustion, the connection between combustion and climate change is right, is right there. In fact, it isn't even on this side, because on this side there's water vapor saturation on top of it. But here is where the burning is actually warming and changing our climate. And that, believe it or not, is, the, in, is precisely where the biggest connection sits. And what I'm saying in other language is that the greenhouse effect um, is the, is the re reflect backward, downward reflecting infrared radiation of the process that is attempting for, by which the Earth cools itself off to space. Instead of getting straight out, because of the gases in the atmosphere, uh, the, there's some of that radiation comes back down again. And on the surface, it's warmer than it would otherwise be. Many of you know that if you put in the numbers, we would, have, we would not have liquid oceans if it weren't for the downward, downward reflection of the, of the uh, outgoing infrared. So here, you have, or, so here you have the core of what we're uh, talking about. Now, this is you know, Earth Science 101. I think many of you have seen it before. I can't, I just want to sort of locate the discussion there. 
And at that point, move directly into a discussion of carbon dioxide. But before I do, is, are there any questions on the, this sort of first crude thing? Why, why is carbon dioxide interesting and important? Should I, should I drive on? Quick question. What about the water vapor from aircraft contracts? It's, water vapor has to be thought of as superimposed on all of that water vapor up there already. And so it's unlikely that a human source of water vapor, if even build a dam and have a lot of extra water vapor evap from evaporation of a lake, there are many ways in which you can think about getting, the, getting more moisture into the atmosphere. It shows up in some way, but people generally don't even calculate it. What does happen is the carbon dioxide warms the planet. Then you get more evaporation from the ocean surface. And then you get hotter air can contain more water vapor by the clausius clapeyron relationship. And so you actually have a much larger issue of water vapor amplifying the carbon dioxide signal from these indirect effects of warming the sea surface and the atmosphere itself than from anything like contrails. Contrails, however, if they affect not as water vapor, but if they start making clouds, then you have a different ballgame, which I'll be getting to, which has to do with how reflective the, the Earth is. And that's another place where contrails play a role. Any other question? I have to limit them, but we can have a couple. OK? So let's drive on. And let's be quantitative about carbon dioxide. Um, again, if I'm covering ground, for how many of you, if I'd asked you, could tell me beforehand how many tons of carbon dioxide are in the atmosphere right now? It's not a number that people generally talk about. Yet it's a well-defined number. And it is 3,000 billion tons. And um, you can work that out from knowing another unit, which is the parts per million. Actually, I'm, I'm getting a slide ahead of me, uh, oh, half a slide ahead of me. Let's just look at that picture for a minute. It's telling you how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere today, 3,000 billion tons. It's telling you with a green line how much carbon dioxide there was in the atmosphere in 1,800 back to maybe at least back to, to uh, zero, uh, birth of Christ. Um, about one third, we're up, up more than a third, but we're up about 40% from that pre-industrial number. And the third number on there is, I'll talk about a little bit more too, is we know that during the ice ages, when the planet was, northern hemisphere was covered with ice, there was less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than in the period of, say, Shakespeare's time. So by about as much down as we are now up. So those three numbers give you a kind of scale for carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, and you obviously will say, well, how much are we putting in right now? Obviously, I'm going in that direction, so just hold on. But I wanted first to call attention to what I call the Rosetta Stone. There are three different units for discussing global carbon dioxide. And they are completely convertible to one, from one to the next. So uh, one of the reasons for confusion and, and a modest price of entry into this field is that these three units are used uh, by different communities, generally not even discussing what the other ones are. They are tons of carbon dioxide, tons of carbon, and um, parts per million by volume, meaning fraction of molecules. The planet has about 390 <laughs> molecules out of a million that are carbon dioxide right this second when you're breathing. Actually, it's more like 395 right this second. And um, the conversion, which again, you have a hard time finding in the literature, is 7.8 billion tons of carbon dioxide per part per million. But you can calculate that. You have to say, figure out how much atmospheric mass and molecules there are. And you can do that by the surface of the Earth times atmospheric pressure. Um, and then you uh, can go on. Now, carbon and carbon dioxide are both used in different communities. If you're in the biology or geosciences world, the conserved quantity is carbon. You pull it out of the ground, and a, a plant takes it out of the atmosphere. It goes, into photo, it goes into a leaf. The leaf decomposes on the forest floor. Carbon is what's conserved. So the, the natural scientists, for the most part, like to talk in tons of carbon or billions of tons of carbon. If you're in the finance world, and you're talking about a market that will pay a power company to emit less carbon, the thing that you're focused on is carbon dioxide. 
And so the policy world with markets and whatnot is all about tons of carbon dioxide. They simply coexist. You have to be ready to go both ways. I tend to have moved my conversation into units of tons of carbon dioxide because that lets me talk to the largest number of people. So there are 3,000 billion tons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and 390 parts per million. There is this, I mentioned the, pre the, the glacial time period. Most of you know, or maybe all of you know, that we have learned a lot about the Earth's past, approximately 800,000 years of the past, by going straight down in Antarctica with cord and with amazing good luck, I think, the bubbles in the ice, trapped in the ice, preserve the atmosphere of, of the past time. So the deeper you go, as in tree rings going into the center of the tree, the further you're going into the past. And what has been learned is that the, is that the, the cycle of ice ages coincides with the cycle of carbon dioxide. Uh, in other words, somehow carbon dioxide is involved in the process of creating and get in, going into and out of ice ages in some complex interaction with other issues. The precise way in which we go into ice ages and come out of ice ages is still not known. I will be very surprised if it doesn't happen in your, in your life, per, lifetimes, and probably will happen in the first 20 years of your lifetime, that we will actually understand the ice ages. We're awfully close, but we're not all the way there. But we know the correlation, unmistakably, that the carbon dioxide level goes with the temperature level, and I think my next slide shows that. And so you, in, this ca in this case, you're going forward in time, and you realize it isn't that it's a sort of a sawtooth, the, the carbon dioxide concentration, so is the temperature. Um, here you have carbon dioxide, methane, and temperature together for three, for four ice age cycles. You're now going back further than that, for about eight, eight ice age cycles. Yes? I always wonder with these plots, what's the error? Oh, yeah. I mean, the precision of this kind of analytical chemistry, I don't know the answer to your question. Is it, I mean, they wouldn't be drawing lines like this if they didn't have a lot of confidence in the, at the level of a few parts, whether it's five or one. Uh, Michael Bender, who's down the hall from me, could tell me, but I have actually never formulated that question. Uh, but 250 to moving between 280 and 180 in the sawtooth manner, and then some of the details are actually, have been, especially go closer to the present, have been dug out more. And the, the Greenland ice camp ice cores allow you to get the first ice age, for example, and you get and you get much more, much more detail. But I think you should assume those error bars are are quite small. I would, I'm, I'm gonna somebody find out and let me know, and I'm gonna guess five. I guess I can't hear you. Paleoclimate meaning, well, this is usually called paleoclimate, but go millions of years, much different. You know, if you, you don't have trap bubbles, you're doing everything by proxy, and it's a completely much, much more guesswork. But these are trap bubbles, and then if, they're, if they haven't been mixed, they're always looking for contamination, they're discarding data that clearly was not where the air mixed up, got mixed up, and so on. And the most recent data set, this I call the poster child of this field, is the last 50 four years, um, which is a, hero a heroic <laughs> achievement for the for first 40 of those years of really one guy named Ralph David Keeley, who set up a laboratory on the slopes of Hawaii and measured CO2 levels, um, and didn't expect, as far as I understand it, to see this interesting rising oscillating curve until he had a year or two of data and said, oh my goodness. And it has been uh, churning out oscillations on an annual basis ever since. And the, uh, I assume most of you know the story here. The oscillations are the breathing of the atmosphere, passing atmosphere, passing, or the breathing of the forest, CO2 going into the forest and back to the atmosphere over a growing season and a season of decay. And the rise is due to carbon dioxide from fossil energy, primarily some by reduction by cutting down forests, by primarily by fossil energy. And how many of you have done, ever done this problem in a problem set? Ask how much the rise would be if all the fossil energy that we burned was, would stay in the atmosphere. And compare that to the slope here, 
uh, of this line. Has anybody done that calculation? Because I've been arguing that that sort of calculation should be in elementary physics or high school, or, or AP physics or something. Any, none of you has done that calculation. But if you do, you discover that the slope is approximately twice what you see here. We go up like that. If you started here, we go up about like that. Um, you can see that you can calculate that. Everything is, cal is sort of straightforward calculation and very accessible quantitative stuff, and yet we haven't internalized it even into a, a science and engineering education, which is why I'm doing this today. I want to have you comfortable with the idea that you can probe environmental questions, not just take them for granted or listen to people shouting at each other. You can actually get this stuff straight. So why two to one? What is that telling you? Huh? Who's talking? Who, I can't. Who's, can you raise your hand? Who's talking? I didn't see you. Okay. Something is taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere while we are burning it and putting it in. Those are called carbon sinks. And there are two carbon sinks. One is the ocean. One is terrestrial biomass. They're the two main ones. The ocean surface you will not be surprised to learn, is in equilibrium between the atmosphere and CO2 in solution. So it's called Henry's Law. If I put CO2 in the atmosphere, some of it goes into the ocean at the surface to sustain equilibrium. About half of what's missing is going into the ocean. And the other half, a quarter of the total emissions, is going into forests actually getting bigger. In the case of the oceans, we understand the, the whole system pretty well. In the case of why the which land is getting bigger, we're just getting that straight. Which forests are growing, which ones aren't around the world. But the oceans are getting CO2. Some of the CO2 is going into the oceans. What happens then? It's not, if, if you put nitrogen in the ocean, it kind of stays nitrogen. Put CO2 in the ocean, it's a, it participates in life. But first of all, it participates in certain equilibrium reactions with two other forms of carbon and water, and oxygen and water, called bicarbonate and carbonate. So there is a complex ocean chemistry set in motion and affected by the, by the um, CO2. In particular, CO2 is a weak acid, and so the ocean gets uh, more acidic. Now this, you may never have seen. It's another slide that folks with our backgrounds can enjoy. Uh, what are you looking at here? The Mauna Loa curve. The Hawaii. You are looking at the CO2 in the ocean water, not quite as high a concentration, but nearly. And this is the driving force for the Henry process. And then this is the pH on the right-hand side of the ocean, having its same, and this is actually not far from Hawaii, in the ocean, remote, remote, far from land. And you have an oscillation of an annual sort mirroring the ocean the CO2 in the ocean, and falling by about a half a 0.05 pH units in the time period from 1990 to 2005. Quite clear where this curve is going if we don't do anything about it, and this curve too. The ocean becoming steadily more acidic, uh, by inevitably, you know, be by, by way of putting CO2 in the atmosphere. More particularly, we can look at the equilibrium <coughs> ratios of these three species, CO2 in solution, bicarbonate, and carbonate. And we are perched now at around just above eight. And bicarbonate is by far the dominant ion. But if, as we move away from there, one of the things that happens is, that, is the carbonate ion. If we go in this direction, which is acidification, the carbonate ion goes down. The carbonate ion is what's involved in coral reefs and shell making in general. And so shell making organisms have a tougher time just because we burn stuff. Keep coming back to we burn stuff. That will be my refrain. Methane, too, is going up for various reasons. Important because methane is, we, did, we could have picked, pointed that out on the earlier graph. Methane itself is an infrared absorbing gas which contributes to the greenhouse effect. In fact, per ton of methane, it's about 20 times more powerful than carbon dioxide in absorbing outgoing radiation and warming the planet. Um, and so methane leakage from methane systems like natural gas systems or flaring systems of, at, at oil fields, which are a combustion system as you, as you burn 
natural gas in a, in a cook stove, does any natural gas escape without burning at all? Under what systems are we having methane leakage from methane systems? We're getting, thinking much more deeply into the subject in the last few years. Fracking, which is developing methane fields in, in rock, has now raised the question, how much methane is escaping as methane while you're bringing the methane out of, a, out of these rocks in fracking formation? If there's a substantial amount, let's say 5% of the CO2 you're, of the methane you're producing is not actually caught, you've got a high, you've got a high greenhouse fuel instead of a low greenhouse. So uh, methane has been added to the picture. And you see that as a curve like carbon dioxide, you're at one, you're at just about two parts per million, just close to two parts per million. But a steeply rising, a, a, race, a ratio larger than the ratio for CO2 in terms of pre-industrial and today, a ratio of somewhat more than two. And this is the graph. This is a lot of stuff on this graph. But this is the, this is the I want to take a couple of minutes with this, because on one scale here, you have much of what I've been telling you. And the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which reports the state of the science on a five-year interval uh, and is a close to an authority on what we know collectively. They, they negotiate this, uh, this result, contradicts that result, and they look at it closely. And they come out with the best view we can of the state of the science. And uh, this is one of five slides, five figures that made it into the executive summary to summarize what we know as of three years ago. It will change by the next report. But the unit here is watts per square meter. And this is measuring, perched at, at the top of the troposphere, it's exactly what height. And then measuring the, watt, the, the radiation flow downward from light uh, that's, coming, that's coming up uh, from infrared radiation. And there's a carbon dioxide weighing in now at about 1.5, 1.6 watts per square meter of warming now relative to the pre-industrial atmosphere. This is the additional warming relative to the pre-industrial atmosphere. Methane is sitting there about a quarter as important, a third as important as, as CO2. Second gas is nitrous oxide, and the third gas are the so-called halocarbons, which are, which are CFC, CFC 11 and 12, which is carbon, a, methane, a fully substituted methane molecule with, with chlorine and fluorine. Um, and then you have additional downed radiation due to the ozone. On the other side, warming the planet, are these aerosols I was telling you were going to be stage center as a link between combustion and climate change. So here they are, with very large error bars, because we don't understand this part of the climate system very well. Error bars come because they are related, they, they are related to cloud formation and the precise mechanisms of cloud formation, which is not a combustion topic, but a very interesting piece of science, are far from understood. So you guys are going to put the aerosols in the atmosphere, and we don't know quite what they're going to do. Or more particularly, you guys are going to reduce the flow of CO2, in, of aerosols into the atmosphere, which is going to uh, make the greenhouse effect stronger. And one of the things that we are pretty sure of is that the the global goal driven by public health of taking aerosols out of combustion sources, be they diesel engines or coal power plants, is going to increase the amount of global warming. There is a trade-off between a public health objective and a clean greenhouse gas ob objective. And for, all, for virtually all of us, the public health objective must win. And that will mean that we will see a larger greenhouse signal and then have to deal with it. Uh, I didn't say, but so let me say, it. why do clouds cool the planet? They reflect, they are white, and they reflect incoming sunlight. So that first curve I showed you where you calculate the, the black body temperature, if you put in a fraction of sunlight that never does warm the planet, it's reflected out, it's about 31% of incoming sunlight that doesn't actually warm the planet, but gets reflected right back out to space before it has a chance to thermalize. That fraction, 31%, could become 32% with additional cloud formation through aerosols. It might go down to 30% as we clean up the aerosols. And if you work that out, that's a percent in albedo is a huge temperature change. So I hope you're all with me. And now when we talk about aerosols, let me just warn you that another subject coming down the pike that you are, you are going to wrestle with is whether we should deliberately modify the planet uh, to counteract the greenhouse warming that we're doing. And this, curve, this image is often brought forward. This is a picture from 1991 
in the Philippines, where the last, which is the last time a major volcano erupted. There hasn't been a, a volcanic eruption that large since then. And, but there were many in the past, including larger ones than this. Um, but it was big enough to inject a lot of sulfate aerosol into the stratosphere. The stratosphere, as most of you know, the word stratum means sort of levels, is not a very turbulent place, so that particles that fall, that, that, that are deposited into the stratosphere, it's hard to get them up there. But if the volcano is big enough, they do get up there, and they don't settle out quickly, because it's kind of, a, because hot is below cold, and so, sorry, cold is below hot, and so you have a stable, a stable atmosphere, and it takes a year or two for particles to come out. So if we've got enough basic concepts under our belt to realize that there are going to be a bunch of questions if you start to deliberately counter the warming of the planet by carbon dioxide, by cooling the planet with albedo change, by putting stratospheric particles that reflect sunlight, not creating clouds, you're above the clouds, but actually reflecting directly off the particles themselves, incoming sunlight. How much cancellation do you get? Do you get rainy seas? Do you get a cancellation in rain and droughts that accompanies the cancellation in temperatures? People are working some of that out today. There will be an engineering community that wants to bring this forward as engineers' contribution to human betterment. And there will be others who are questioning whether this is what we should be doing with the planet. Do we know enough? And that will be a live argument for sure in your careers. And you're going to have to be well-educated to figure out where you want to come out on a subject like that. Um, so I've got, are there questions at this point? I'm sure I'm keeping track of time. Your question? Yes. Oh, we got two. Okay. Back first. Yes. Loud and clear. I've heard of a study that checked the isotopic composition of the CO2 stored in these bubbles in the ice versus the uh, composition you have now. Have you seen this study? Well, there are a lot of studies. First of all, carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14. There are three isotopes. Are those inclusive So 14 is absent completely from archived from geological air because its lifetime is 5,000 some 700 years, I think it is, half-life. And so uh, it's gone. Um, and carbon-14 is a tracer for anything related to the biological part. The carbon-12, carbon-13, two stable isotopes and their ratios, I don't know what's been learned from that, that that would teach you all sorts of things about past climate, for example but I don't know whether that has been productive and how far it's gone. It'd be an interesting thing for one of you to look into. It's also used in trying to understand methane. I mean, the, the, those, three, yeah, those three tracers are, give you all sorts of options. Sort of the hydrogen ones for methane. Okay, so I want to take a few minutes to talk about uncertainties and all that I've told you. But, um, but primarily, I'm turning, this is sort of a transition of a few slides to talking about future emissions. Well, I had, there was one other hand. I'm sorry, there were two hands. Yeah, it's yours. Um, have you heard about like, a similar idea of uh, like, except placing like, small reflective surfaces in orbit? Yeah. You think that's a, a possibility? OK, so it's a, it would be more complete for me to have said there are a variety of ways of increasing the albedo and reflecting incoming sunlight from painting roofs white to putting particles in the stratosphere, to putting shields in deep space, such as at L1, this Lagrange point, which is relatively balanced between Earth and Moon um, and Sun. And uh, all of them being for the same purpose of reflecting of another percent or so of incoming sunlight. Assembling something large like that in space has been seriously considered and costed in terms of numbers of rockets and so forth, costs. Um, stratospheric aerosols tends to be the favorite, partly because of cost of people working this out right now, but there are, there are chemical interactions with ozone that are of concern, that are of no concern at all if you're in deep space. So you have, yes, there's more to the subject than what I told you in that direction. Uh, are we gonna really, I, I think when, when I look at you and you think about now to 2060, 2070, how live, what's going to happen to this argument? I don't know. 
I think we've, it's just beginning. There's a, there's a Google group that I listen to on, geoengin on geoengineering. And many of those people are hot to trot. They want to get the stuff out there. They want to try it. Other groups are just holding back and saying, never. This is going to be too risky. Or we just don't belong doing it. So we've just begun to see that argument. But I'm glad we're taking a couple of minutes with it because geoengineering in its various guises, the concept of engineering the planet, not just letting things happen that are the consequences of what we're doing inadvertently. The argument is made by many that by deciding not to stop burning fossil fuels, we are geoengineering the planet. We did it yesterday, we're doing it today. For others, there's a level of intent and deliberate intervention that is qualitatively different from riding your motorbike and having some CO2 come out the tailpipe versus actually putting a particle, a layer of aerosols in the stratosphere. I hope you'll talk about this among yourselves and keep track of it and figure out what you believe. Last question. Are there any other factors involved in global warming? For example, the changes in the solar radiation power, the changes in the solar radiation power, the changes in the solar radiation power? That's a good question. And um, the, if this, the answer is that the variations in the strengths of, this, of sunlight could become important. We don't have such a perfect understanding of the sun that we don't know that it won't decide to be a tenth of a percent less uh, energy generating uh, next year. The, we have a certain short period of record. There is a small term actually on that very bar graph that I showed you, there was a term for sunlight, which is a small rectangle. After that one, I'm not sure what we are missing uh, from the picture that of what I've just told you. But solar variations in the solar constant are, are often brought up by people who are skeptical of the whole greenhouse effect as if nobody thought about it. Of course, they have. Satellites are now measuring the solar constant very accurately, but they haven't been doing it for very long, and, and so on. There is a sunspot cycle of 14 years, which has its own consequence. Cosmic rays can sometimes be thought to affect cloud formation through the ionization. There are little byways in, in the subject. I don't want to, I shouldn't say I've closed them all off. I haven't. Okay? So let's, a, a bit about uncertainty. This is a, this is what, this is a, ca this captures what we know least well in another way from what I've said it before, which is if I have a certain concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, how hot will it get? And the answer depends on feedback loops. If carbon dioxide alone does a certain amount of warming that we can calculate pretty accurately from careful measurements across the wavelengths of, of infrared radiation. But it makes the planet warmer, which evaporates water especially. So we get a water feedback. And then we get cloud formation. And at the end of the day, we are not sure how much warming would come about from a given amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. So in this curve, the, dependent, the independent variables, in my head anyway, CO2 is on the y-axis. And the width of that line in the horizontal direction describes the amount of temperature rise we could get. And if I haven't managed to lose my little. Thank you. Uh, the particular, much of the discussion is about, is, is refers to the doubling of CO2 just for convenience, relative to pre-industrial concentration, which is from 280 to 560 ppm. And then that's called the climate sensitivity, as a, whose units is temperature. And the central value is about 3 degrees Celsius, which says that if we double the carbon dioxide concentration and wait a very long time, the planet will probably get on the surface, the surface of the planet will get 3 degrees warmer, relative to pre-industrial times. It's already a half a degree warmer. Um, but the uncertainty is the width of that line. And the blue area was supposed to be one standard deviation. I'm now taking you inside the discussion in the IPCC circa 2006 as they were getting ready to come out with their final report. And they were, they were calling this one standard deviation, essentially. And on the, on the left-hand end, the possibility that the, the Earth wouldn't get very warm at all, uh, they were ready even to break that zone into a 7% and 10%. 66 from 100 is 34, so there should be 17 on each side. And the 17 on this side would have been a 
a simple declaration of, of what we know. But they had a discussion, of the, these are the climate scientists of the world, about whether to say 17% or to come up with a word instead, because they weren't so sure about that 17%, even though they said they were sure about 66%. I'm presenting a muddle and a, uh, a con the, among the climate scientists. So they had a debate about whether this should be 17% or cannot be excluded, and cannot be excluded one. And so it doesn't say 17% in the literature, uh, even though what's one of the most important questions one can ask is what are the chances that feedback loops will really make things a lot worse instead of somewhat worse? It's really the, one of the things we're asking about climate change. Is we're tinkering with the Earth. Are we going to set something in motion, which is a positive feedback loop that's going to, and so it's terribly important to know more about the high tail. And yet, the climate scientists themselves were undecided about how even to talk about the high tail in the report that came out in 2008. There'll be another one in 2013. Presumably, they will say more on this subject. This slide is a fugitive slide that somebody sent me when I went into this subject uh, to tell me that it would be helpful to understand that it was a time when they were debating two, po two possible things to say, and they chose one of them. Question back there, but I'm worried about it. Say, now you can't hear me. What part of what I just said did you not hear? Lots? <laughs> All right, let me drive on. I'll try to, if, now would you give me another version? Actually, no, I thought there was a question. Oh, you're going to run up there? No, I can repeat the questions. We don't have time to do that. I, I won't, I'll have to leave it away. Any feedback if I get close to it? Can I do both? No. This will be fine. Testing, testing. Yes. All right, we'll try the, this one. You have to go like this. Is that Hold good? It, like, yeah. Rock star? Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right, so I can move around then, which I think for three hours I better plan on doing a little moving around. Yes, who's up? Yes. Each of those is a piece of science that is beyond my knowledge and uh, complicated. Questions about whether the Gulf Stream would be shut down by a certain amount of heating turned out to be extremely complicated and people are less worried about it than they were earlier with models that were better. I don't know the details of that. Ice melting, uh, <laughs> driven by ocean currents. These are complicated questions, each and every one of them. With if you've got time in your graduate school, take an Earth's, take a, take a geophysical fluids course which builds on exactly the same fluids equations you've been learning and learn some of this and see where we are. My number one point for this whole two, three hours is don't be afraid of climate science. You've got the tools to learn it. Don't let somebody else tell you what the answer is. Dig in and find out. You've asked a question that would be a good example of that if that, really, that was what particularly intrigued you is ocean circulation and, and rising temperatures. Not a, not a simple story, obviously. So we, summarizing in, my, in English, we don't know how large a problem we face. The best and worst future climate outcomes consistent with today's science are very different because feedbacks are, are, are unknown or, or poorly known, and we have discordant views um, because climate science is a human enterprise and people have particular ways of thinking about it coming from one particular database, for example. People from studying the past climates will have a different answer from people who are studying the modeling of the present time. So one of the things that has been most mixed up in the public discussion with the media is, oh, we've got a new surprise. We thought we had the answer and now suddenly there's something about cosmic rays. No, this, we're going to find out lots of new things. Or, you told me that two degrees was an impossible boundary, and now I understand that we'll still be alive above two degrees, temperature rise. Yes, of course we will. So the subject is full of complexity, and yet we're, we're, we are changing the planet in quantitatively significant amounts by as much in carbon dioxide concentration as the ice ages, and then some in the opposite direction. It gives one pause. Just two, two ideas of two different kinds of uncertainty. I want to move quickly here now. Um, for the, same, for the same climate model, but two different views of how much we will emit 
decade by decade in the way of CO2, how much we will have brought on control technologies, you get this nice picture drawn by McElroy at Harvard where he says that Massachusetts in summer is already warmer than it was. Um, Massachusetts, to all intents and purposes, has moved over to Rhode Island uh, already up here. And then uh, the next four are two pairs. If we don't burn a whole lot of carbon dioxide, the, models, the climate model says we could end up here. Burning more carbon dioxide, we could end up here for the, as a representation of summer in the, 20, in the middle of the century and toward the end of the century end up here or here. Exaggeration of the exaggerating uh, a, a still larger difference. So up to us how much carbon we burn for the same model we get this kind of a picture, which is kind of pretty. On the other hand, holding the, holding the emissions constant, but asking how good the models are, we get uh, another representation where here the question is, is, the, is various parts of the United States going to be drier or wetter than uh, they are now? And the, the what's, so the answer to that is shown in color and the south, basically dry, dry climates get drier and wet climates get wetter seems to be a general result coming out of climate models, not the answer you might like. And um, the southwest is going to get drier, but then in addition, uh, if an area is hatched, uh, that means the climate models are agreeing with each other, and when they aren't hatched, the climate models aren't agreeing with each other, and the climate models themselves are a source of uncertainty about the field. Yes, quick. What are you here? This is percent change in annual runoff, which means the, from various regions. What, what's, runoff is the net flow of water out of the region, down rivers. What, is that, okay? So, um, summing this up, my, my buddy Steve Pakala coined the phrase monsters behind the door. We really don't know how bad a problem climate change is going to be. But we ha it's consistent with various things going wrong. So imagine that there are various bad outcomes which today are rattling a door that they are into a space they have not yet entered. And how well is the door secured? A five, mile, a five meter rise in sea level by the end of the century would be devastating. An ice age cycle is about 100 meters. The last time we came out of an ice age, it did get about five meters higher. The IPCC projection is something like 30 centimeters, but they say we're not allowing for ice, significant ice age ice sheet melting. People thought that was a strange thing to do, and the prop, well, surely the number will be more like a meter coming out of the next report. But we really don't know how much ice melting, quite close to the previous question. May, drying storm systems, typhoons, monsoons, another area where we really don't know how bad things could get for the same amount. And more like, more correctly, how soon things could get bad. Right now, we have this country retreating from climate change. Nobody wants to talk about it. Uh, the policy initiatives have kind of gone into the sand. Obama doesn't think it's to his benefit to talk about it. Republicans are making fun of it. The science is there. The science is uncertain. I think if we had started from that point, we would be in less, in less trouble and less divided on this topic. It's not a piece of doctrine. It's an evolving scientific understanding. Major changes in forests uh, because of climate change, not because we're cutting them down. And then some of these feedbacks, like the, in the northern, in the Arctic, there's a lot of gas trapped in the permafrost and in something called clathrates, which are ice crystals with, with gas molecules inside them, which could warm, thaw, and release that gas. And that particular feedback would, uh, and that gas itself would be climate would be infrared absorbing, and so you get a positive feedback. These things are hanging around, and we can't rule them out. So that's part one of today's talk. And on the second part, I'll, I, will have, I have too much material. I'll give you some sense of some of the issues that at least I think about when we talk about carbon dioxide, future emissions, who's going to do them, and how we might organize some of that. But first of all, to just get a sense of what's happening right now. So first of all, the way the conversation tends to get posed is some future CO2 level above where we are right now is some kind of a target. 
whether expressed in parts per million or whatever, and from here to there is a certain headroom. The amount we'll be able to emit from all people over a period of time, a long period of time. So if we use it up now, we can't use it later. If, if the United States and China use it up now, it's not available for countries come along, coming along behind us. Um, and so that particular line is, that particular top line that is drawn at twice pre-industrial. That's the 560 ppm. It turns out that's 1,400 billion tons of carbon dioxide added to the atmosphere, and that would be the quota. That would be all we would have. You can say, well, does any of this make sense? Well, it, they become ways of then calculating what kinds of changes we would make in the energy system to reach some of these points, as we'll talk about in the second half of the class. So here are some projections from the International Energy Agency out of, um, here we saw 1,400 billion tons of carbon dioxide. And here we have uh, the United States having already emitted 320 billion tons of carbon dioxide um, that are in the atmosphere or somewhere, or in some sink, and projected by in the next in that 25-year interval to go another to go up to 470, which is maybe 140 billion tons of carbon dioxide. 10% of that total, but you probably divide by two because they'll still be sinks. So maybe we put in 140 billion tons, 70 stays in. You think that way? We'd like to have better models of sinks than a factor of two, and there are better models, but that's the kind of calculation you do. You see, China expected over the next 25 years to put quite a bit more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than the United States. Uh, according to these models, and the International Energy Agency is one of the authorities in projecting futures. They, people do this very carefully. A lot of people pay attention to their numbers. It doesn't mean they're right. But this is a view of the world in which China continues to grow in its level of, 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 of productivity. And that, along with that comes additional carbon dioxide. And by the time 2035 comes around, it has emitted almost as much into the atmosphere as the United States, even though it's way behind right now. And you can see what kinds of arguments can follow from that kind of a curve. The European Union is more carbon efficient than we are with roughly the same population in that 25-year period. India and Japan are shown as well. There's not the whole world. You add that up, it uh, doesn't, it's not more than 50, 60 percent of the world. Um, so now, finally, the number that I was holding back, which is how many tons of carbon dioxide are we putting in the atmosphere right now through combustion of fossil fuels? Answer, 30 billion tons. Roughly 1% per year is entering the bathtub from the faucet called burning fossil fuels. 1% per year. The rest, that's, and now we also know that half a percent stays in, and the other half goes elsewhere. So we have. Uh, added the number that makes the transition to talk about the actual emissions, who's doing them, and by what fuel, and so forth. Again, some of you in the room will have seen a lot of this. I'm not sure how much. Sorry, jumped ahead. Um, take 30 billion tons of carbon dioxide, divide by the world's population, and you get the world's population is 7 billion people. You get 4 tons of CO2 per person per year as a useful number to know. When you talk about your carbon footprint or something like that, your share of today's global emissions is four, pushing five. I just recently saw a number that were up to 35 billion tons of carbon dioxide in the last, in, uh, a, year, a year back, which is up from 30, 32. So it may even be five, but I use four in the next slide. So hang on to four tons of CO2 per person per year. You have to keep updating this stuff. So a reasonable question is what uses up four tons of CO2 per year? I feel as if this, in some sense, this is a walking problem set. These are the problems you can assign when you start teaching the subject. How much carbon dioxide is put out when I drive a certain distance with a certain fuel economy and a certain fuel? You can calculate that. It turns out that if I go 24,000 kilometers, 16,000 miles, um, with a, these are European units, five liter per 100 kilometers, which is about 45 miles a gallon, um, I will use up my four tons of CO2 just out the per year, out the gas. Now, most of you are, I don't know, students don't tend to drive 15,000 miles a year, but a lot of Americans do. Students tend not to own 45 mile a gallon cars, but neither do their, the rest of us for the most part. With both of those, you've got a 45 mile a gallon car. Uh, 
ok so that combination gets you your quota if you drive a car that half that fuel economy you can't go only you can only go eight thousand miles a year before you've used up your quota and so on but that's just for cars airplane travel is approximately the same as a forty five gallon mile a gallon car when you're in commercial aircraft uh, um, not business class, economy class. So you, for some of us, our footprint is dominated by the flying term. Mine is. If you have natural gas heat in an average climate like New Jersey, and a modest, or moderate, moderate sized house that's well insulated, or a very small house that isn't, you'll also use up your quota. Now, if you share it with some other people, you only get a certain fraction of that. I share it with my wife. And finally, electricity is the conceptually interesting calculation because you need to know something which you have to go hunt, which is how carbon intensive is the electricity that you're burning. Does it come from coal power? Does it come from hydro and nuclear power? Uh, if it comes from coal power, use 300 kilowatt hours a month, you've used your quota. <coughs> if it comes from, New in New Jersey, it's about double that because we have a mix of nuclear, natural gas, and coal. Uh, coal largely imported, but we have to count it. <coughs> coal power imported, not coal imported. So that calculation gives you a sense that it's pretty hard for an American not to use more than four tons of CO2 per year. And the national average, as you'll see in a moment, is 20 tons of CO2 per year. One more slide before I take the question. This is just your personal activity. Those of us at Princeton University can ask the question, how much do we have to add to our footprint because we work here? In 2007, this university put about 100,000 tons of CO2 in the atmosphere, and there are about 10,000 of us, 12,000 of us, so nine tons of CO2 per year was our quota from just living here if we take ownership of the CO2 used uh, coming from uh, the burning, from making of electricity and, and heat for buildings, including the laboratories and the dormitories, not including commuter travel, but actually just what's used right here on site or bought for use on site from utilities. Now, so my question at the bottom there is how many of you have been involved at all with carbon targets for your campus, whether even either setting them or thinking about how to meet them? They've become a pretty big, they were at least a year or two back, a pretty big deal on Princeton's campus. We have a goal for 2020. Uh, we are consciously trying to meet it. The Board of Trustees wants us to meet it, their investments. How many of you are at all involved in the carbon issues of your home campus? One. That's not good. That's not, that is another interesting physical system with system boundary. What is the campus doing in the way of, of contributing to energy flows, water flows, paper flows, iron and steel flows? Chemical engineers in particular, chemists, we own the only idea of mass flows and stops, and actually taking these systems seriously. You can learn an enormous amount from, from your own campus's energy decisions. And in some schools, it's actually a quite conscious process. University is building, if you have a little, want a little jog, you'll go out Washington Road to Route 1, and 3 quarters of the way down there to the right, you'll see a dirt road and maybe a fence, but you can walk around the fence. Don't let it stop you, even though you're trespassing. And you'll see a five megawatt renew, uh, photovoltaic system being nearly finished, about to go online, which was university's investment in PV from this past, but built over the last three or four months. Very exciting development. 25 acres, five megawatts. Get a look, see what it looks like. Lots, 16,000 panels. So get involved in campus energy, for goodness sake. That's, 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 you'll learn so much and so easily, and you'll have fun. And you'll be campus heroes. Yes. Do you hear me? Is this not on? It's on. I wasn't holding close enough. Thank you. Did you hear that? Get involved in campus energy. Other question.
Why don't people like numbers more than they do? Why don't they like this stuff more than they do? I'd, let's let that be a discussion for the break, okay? Because it's a good question, but I don't have any more wisdom than you. Why don't people like this stuff? Does it make, you get, you get kind of keen on it. You, get, you kind of, I think there's a, this is kind of neat for many of you. It's very accessible. I hope so. But you damn know damn well that many of your friends would say boring, right? I think so. But I'd be happy to discuss this further. I don't know the answer to your question, and I think it's a good one. This is about the pros prosperous. This whole problem comes because we're living well. This is not a problem of being desperately poor and trying to fix it. And that's very important. A friend of mine said, look, there are problems of poverty and there are problems of modernity, and this is a problem of modernity. And you will define what the good life is and what you spend your time on. Will you seek to travel a great deal? Will you seek to own a great big house? Will your friends want to own a great big house? What are we, what are we actually defining? It's not just the technology that's going to solve this problem. Let me talk now about nations. And so you get, I told you that the US was using 20 tons of carbon dioxide per capita per year. This very simple graph has population on the x-axis and per capita consumption on the y-axis. So areas are proportional to emissions. And the United States is that leftmost orange rectangle. Uh, China is the big white purple line, and this was for 2005, by purple rectangle. And China is almost double, double uh, in 2011 of what it was in 2005 in height. It's a little bigger in the wide as well. There are three numbers on there, 20, 4, and 1. 20 to get your bearings with what the US, Canada, a couple of other countries are actually consuming per capita. I think Australia is up there. Uh, Europe and Japan are about halfway. Now China is too. Four is the world average, and one is actually the kind of level we will need for climate stabilization. The sinks are, gonna ab are able to remove maybe 10 billion tons of CO2 a year. Maybe. And if they do, that's 10 billion people times one ton per capita. So we're talking about somehow, in the course of this century, changing the energy system to the point where the emissions of the US are like India today, or Africa today, getting 90, 95% of the CO2 emissions out of the system. Not tomorrow, but over your careers, getting a good fraction of that job done. We don't really know how to do it. And, um, but we'll be talking about some of the options in the second half. In terms of the first derivative of that figure, uh, this, is a, this graph immediately shows two big circles, the US and China. The little triangles are pointing up or down. The ones pointing up meant that it's bigger than the year before. The ones pointing down means it's less than the year before. And um, you'll find a pattern where most of the developing world was growing in its carbon dioxide emissions. This was a recession year. Most of the developed world was actually emitting less in that year. But these were the, the circles areas are proportional to the emissions themselves. And you get a sense of, um, you get quite a lot of information from there. Uh, this is not per capita. This is the total per country. Everything in this point is a per country numbers. This is, I'm, I'm partly showing you how some of my favorite ways of displaying data. Part of this, um, a subtle message here is look for interesting ways of presenting data. This is four different ways of partitioning the world. The first is the cumulative emissions of carbon dioxide. All the emissions to date, who did them? The second is today's emissions of carbon dioxide, all the of the total going today to the atmosphere, who's doing it? The third is relative to last year, uh, who's, how much, if there's a certain amount of additional emissions, who's responsible for the increment? And the fourth is population. So actually the first three is, second is a derivative of the first and third is a derivative of the second, and then population. <coughs> so you see the US at 30% of cumulative emissions, about 20%, 20, 25% of today's emissions, very small fraction of the incremental emissions, and about the same fraction of population, about 6% of world population, um, and so forth. A lot of information there, but the overall message. Is what? The overall message.
the, over, the overall message, that didn't work. <clears throat> the overall message is that the developing countries are, taking a, are going to be accounting for a larger and larger fraction of the world's uh, consumption of everything, and that we are not only confronting our own challenges, but low carbon, low resource intensive development of the developing world. Putting those numbers in context that are on here implicitly, the developing world has about 80% of the world's population and 50% of the emissions so today. That gives you a very simple argument of finger pointing. The developed world says your per capita emissions are four times ours. The developed world says your emissions are 50% of the total. We can't possibly leave you out. And at that level, the argument is extremely stale and unproductive and very much what's going on. I was at Rio last week, which is the conversation about the climate change, but an international, international forum, and the developing and developed countries just talking at each other and absolutely no progress uh, based on this picture. So the politics is extremely messy, but for the science community, the issues of figuring out what low carbon development means, low carbon city planning, low carbon power, power systems, smart grids and all the things that might be done to add efficiency applies in a different way, but in a prominent way in what's going on in the developing world. The developing countries in particular are on, are on the spot to in, because they're doing so much for the first time to invent a low carbon future. And I hope we'll be, uh, we'll be talking about that. Professor Law knows a lot about how that is playing out in China today. Let's focus for a little bit on the very poor. I want you to think about how combustion and the very poorest people of the world come together. Um, we'll start with a picture in which a woman is cooking indoors in an open fire. And it is the number one public health consequence of the energy system, and it's all about incomplete combustion. The, lung dis the respiratory diseases, particularly to women and children, are killing us, you'll see the graph for the next, in the moment, I think 100,000 people a year. And it's completely unnecessary if we could bring moderate, better combustion technology uh, cooking for cooking into the, into, the, into the world. The deaths caused by indoor air pollution are, one, I'm sorry, it was off by a factor of 10. 1.3 million deaths per year is the estimate. This again is the International Energy Agency graph. Um, and most of it is in is in Asia and then in Africa. These are the villages. This is rural energy. It's combustion of biofuels. Uh, largely for cooking, sometimes for other purposes, where it's cold, or for, or, but largely for cooking. Comparing smoke from biomass as a public health issue to malaria or tuberculosis or AIDS, it's, in that, it's, it's among them. And if you compare that to outdoor air pollution consequences in cities, this is bigger. And it's a, it's a direct challenge. There's been a lot of people with your backgrounds who have tried to design efficient cook stoves and make them work and be acceptable. This woman is in a, in a hut where she has a vented, a vented stove, and she is much better off because of that. I don't know the stories behind these pictures, but there is a real way of bringing your combustion expertise into this subject and, and this abomination of public health damage from, from cooking fuel in the poorest of the, in the world. To say nothing of the fact that the fuels themselves are becoming more and more scarce, people are going further and further distances and taking more and more time to find these fuels. And uh, this gives a sense of that people are now walking as much as 10 kilometers per day to collect the fuels. And um, moreover, these projections of the future in the, in, in, that are done by these establishment institutions like the International Energy Agency simply report that as far as they can figure out, the numbers are not going to go down in the next 15 years. That the number of, that there will be more people in some of those villages, there will be very little investment because nobody's geared up to do those investments. That doesn't have to be what happens. Every one of you could adopt a village and somehow find a way to bring modern combustion into that place. But that graph, which shows the same number of people relying on traditional biomass cooking, now you could add venting to all those stoves and be, and be ahead of the game. You have to take that apart carefully. But that's the picture of not getting anywhere 
being complacent, two and a half billion people uh, cooking with traditional fuels. In addition, there's the question of electrification, which, is, which has more like one billion people uh, not having any access to electricity. Another huge issue and a challenge that really could be met. About political will, it's about new technologies, including the so very solar collect collection technologies. The uh, rela relationship of the what's called the Human Development Index, HDI, the y-axis there, which has to do with um, children's uh, health uh, and grade school education and access to water, and a few other, about five or six indices lumped into human de development index. Some of you may know exactly what they are. And a strong correlation in this case with energy consumption per capita, where the poorest countries have very little energy and very little and very low scores on this index. So development is a matter partly of using more energy and then using it well. I'm going to skip that. This shows that we could use fossil energy for the poorest people. And suppose you had one ton of CO2 per year allowed as energy emissions for the poorest people, they would have quite a bit more than they have right now. With today's technologies and fossil fuel allowed in the villages of the world, um, you would have uh, cooking, by, cooking by liquid petroleum gas, which is basically propane. Uh, transport in buses using burning diesel or gasoline, and electricity from, say, a local diesel engine. And you could have, uh, you could have carbon dioxide emissions associated with the poorest people because you chose to use fossil fuels. Now, you may not know why I'm talking this way. Uh, the, there's a debate which I want to reveal which is that the development, the development agencies who are responsible for giving aid to eradicate poverty are being told by some sources that you should not use fossil energy to solve the problems of the poorest people, even if it's cheaper. In some places, solar, solar energy solutions will be cheaper. In other places, fossil energy solutions will be cheaper. There is a, within the climate change communities a sense that we must move away from fossil fuels and we should start with the poor. If they don't have any energy yet, don't use fossil energy. That's, in my mind, imposing an ideological answer on the, and, and we shouldn't be solving climate change on the backs of the poorest people. They, their emissions don't add up to very much when they have this amount of consumption, as you'll see in a moment. But that is a technical argument that you can join by saying, well, what, what would be a low-cost propane engine? what would be a low-cost fossil energy solution for the poor. Right now, all the, most, all the attention is on renewable solutions, uh, photovoltaic collectors and batteries, for example. Um, and there is a role for fossil energy in solving the poorest problems of the poorest people, probably with some very clever combustion devices that some of you may well invent. If I drop from the national to the individual level, just to, just to close out this talk, I want to show you a, um, a way of thinking about this problem that doesn't talk about nations first. Suppose the, suppose the six billion, suppose you had a way of deciding how much each one of you emitted in the way of CO2 to the atmosphere in a given year, such that when you added it all up, it was the total global emissions. We had a, we had a calculation rule that got us close to say you emitted 12, you emitted 15, you emitted three, and then we line them all up, tons of carbon dioxide. We would get a curve that would look like this. And we actually, Chakravarti and et al, is a paper in 2009 where we did all this stuff. And this curve, the green curve, was for 2003, and adds up to 6.2 billion tons of carbon, which is, all right, so sorry, 26, so 26 billion tons of carbon dioxide for that year, and that's the histogram. Um, let's suppose you can concede that we can do this and that, well enough, and then look at a future year, and again, try to figure this out. What you use is income distributions plus national carbon dioxide emissions, and assume that carbon dioxide is related through some power law to income, and you could build up a story like this. So you have this view of emissions, and you see at the end here, the poorest people of the world, a long, long tail ending at 6.2 billion in 23 and 8.1 billion in 2030. 
And here you have, uh, the, we'll be looking at the tail, and here is obviously the highest emitters over here. And I, I circled 10 tons per person. I'm going somewhere with this. First of all, when you do that, you get one more picture of in a global inequality, national inequality, the, rich, the, the richest small percent are responsible for a large fraction of emissions. You get all that story here. We made, we bin this with two tons and 10 tons of carbon dioxide per person. So, so we create three bins. And uh, you see the smallest fraction of the population up there, up above 10, responsible for uh, only, seven, only seven tenths of a billion people responsible for 13 out of 26, half of the emissions of the planet. And then you go to 2030 and the picture doesn't change qualitatively. There are, just, there are more wealthy people. Now we haven't asked about countries. And so if you ask, well, where do these people live? You see the same pattern that, it, that over time, the largest, the, the, the number of high emitters in poor countries becomes significant and becomes comparable to the number of higher emitters in rich countries. Far more pe the OECD is the Europe, US, and Australia, and Japan, and a couple of other countries, uh, is much as about 20% of the world's population. There's a crossover because the long, long tail in this picture is all the non-OECD, the developing world. And um, you get a sense there, the, between 23 and 2030, the developing countries and developed countries are now coinciding in 2030 in the top half of, half of the curve, in the left part of the curve. So you say, where do the wealthy people live? And increasingly, they're divided. And this, this curve here, I want to show you the lower bar. There are above 10 tons per person per year is now in about equal quarters in 2030 by the conventional extrapolations. US one quarter, China one quarter, rest of the OECD one quarter, everybody else one quarter. The everybody else is India, Saudi Arabia, Russia, um, and many, many other, in, uh, many other countries. Um, so that's a picture that there are high emitters everywhere and that the national picture becomes more and more incomplete as development goes on, even though there are far more Look at the bottom group. The, 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 the low emitters are almost entirely in the part of the world which is outside China and outside the OECD. So the poverty is located in one area, but the wealth is, is, well, is more and more widely, more and more evenly distributed. That's the kind of world we're moving into. Um, so that's uh, showing you the, 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 the two extreme regions. I'm going to. Skip that for the moment. And then this is again the distribution, but now in those four parts. Um, if I look at the lowest emitters, I can then do a, a little game, which I really, I really want to go straight to this picture, which is that the area of those two red regions is the same. The triangle represents the extra emissions the poorest people would have if they emitted as much as one ton relative to what they do right now, CO2 per year. So that would be a kind of removal of the most abject poverty. And the job would then be the job of, comp of, of uh, compensating for those extra emissions would require additional work in emissions reduction on the left by the wealthiest people emitting somewhat less, roughly 10% less than they would have otherwise for the top billion people. The message here is that poverty eradication can be done with fossil fuels with very small effort to compensate if you're talking about getting people off the bottom most rung of the ladder where they're, where they're burning dung and they have no access to transport and they have no, in, no electricity. That group of people is in the billions. They can, be dealt, they, can, they can have help of any kind, including fossil energy, and the uh, rest of the world can easily compensate for that. This is not widely understood. You hear over and over again, oh, these people don't have any access to energy and that's gonna break the bank when they finally do. There won't be enough oil, there won't be enough climate uh, absorption. It's not true. Abject poverty can be dealt with. Uh, middle class consumption has to have a lot of attention from all of us to find technical solutions to reduce emissions. What am I doing? This is a picture of emissions over, path, over the path. I'd like to stop now, we're right on time and um, have a half hour break. Try to refresh yourselves and we'll come back. <laughs>